One of the uh, most common questions I get when I'm talking with people is, you know, the way I speak about it, they say, it sounds so convincing. Why don't other scientists get it? Why don't they change their minds? It, it seems like a no-brainer. Well, uh, you have to remember that scientists, and just like everybody else, they're not logic machines. They're smart, but they don't just grind logic without worrying or caring about uh, other things, too. And one big um, factor in the resistance that I uh, get, or the resistance to ID, is that you know, folks who are professionals in the field have a certain pride about the field. They think that, well, they can take care of their own problems, thanks. And it's an interesting uh, fact of history that when Darwin first proposed his idea, most scientists didn't think that his mechanism would work, random mutation and natural selection. Nonetheless, his big impact was that he seemed to show that science could try to explain uh, how life came about and how life changes. So biologists who kind of felt a, a trifle inferior to physicists and chemists, because physicists and chemists could uh, explain everything in their field, or at least it was a problem for them in their field, uh, biologists would always have to worry about uh, theologians and, and ministers and so on. And since life obviously looks designed, uh, they would worry that, uh, that the big questions could only be answered by religion. But once Darwin put forward his theory, everybody said, okay, science has this now. <laughs> and they continue to think that. They, they think that science should explain life without help from anybody. So that's one reason. Another reason is that back in the day, back in the 1920s, before DNA, the role of DNA in life was discovered, uh, some mathematically inclined biologists, uh, they made some calculations on paper and they thought that they, they, they thought that they had shown that there was lots of variation in, in life, enough so that it could explain any, any turn or any new development that life could undergo. There's a guy named Ronald Fisher who said that, hey, you know, if, if a gene, and back when he wrote, which was 1930, the nature of a gene wasn't known, he said that, that if a gene just comes in two types, one, two, and there are just a hundred genes in an organism, then the possible combinations were two to the 100th power. And he says, wow, that's a big number. And there's, all, and there's a lot more genes in organisms than his example presumed. So he thought that there was so much possible variation that random mutation and natural selection could do whatever they want. But he reckoned before DNA was known and the complicated nature of the cell was known. He didn't know that there were such things as molecular machines or genetic codes or many other complex things, and that these things are much more easily broken than they are improved. And so the two variations that he was thinking of, they might exist, but they might be one gene that is working and another copy of the same gene that's broken. And it turns out that they can give different variations in organisms in different circumstances. So you might have all the variation that he thought, but still not be able to explain where these things came from because broken genes do not explain where they came from. So those two reasons and one last one, which is uh, regrettable is that you know, a lot of scientists, certainly not a majority, but a lot, and uh, more so the more prominent scientists, are don't like religion. They don't want the world to have been designed, even if it was 
very helpful, even if it was in the distant past. They just don't want the world to be like that. And we all uh, have our preferences about the way the world should be, but it's the job of science to describe the world as it is, not the way you want it to be.